Thank you, Heidi. Uh, and thank the primary purpose group for inviting me down. <coughs> Get started. You know, my military profession was I did this on a regular basis. Stand behind a podium and talk for hours, 150, 200 people. Never bothered me. It's also where I did a lot of my drinking at, was behind the podium. I was a two-fisted drinker, shot in the beer. I'm still a two-fisted drinker, <laughs> bottle of water and cold. I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today. Going back to that profession, usually instructors, when they got up, they had to tell a joke and uh, kind of break the ice. And I was thinking about this Sunday. I was chairing a meeting, and I, before I introduced the speaker, I told her, I said, I'm going to tell a joke and break the ice for you. She said, okay, no problem. So I tried to think of a clean joke. <laughs> and I ended up coming up with one that Father Martin, I was listening to one of his tapes. And uh, I figured that would be clean enough to tell in an AA meeting. Anyway, this six year old kid told his mother he wanted a bicycle for Christmas. And she told him, won't you pray about it? So that night, he said, God, if you give me that bicycle, I'll be good for a whole year. <laughs> and he thought about it. He knew he couldn't be good for a whole year. So he changed it. God, if you give me that bicycle, I'll be good for six months. And he thought about that. He knew that was impossible. So he said, God, if you give me that bicycle, I'll be good for two days. <laughs> and he thought about that, and he knew he couldn't be good for two days. <laughs> so he looked up on the dress, and he saw a statue of the Virgin Mary. And he took the statue down, he wrapped it up in newspaper, and he said, God, if you ever want to see your mother again. <laughs> I am a chronic alcoholic. My name is Marshall. I uh, introduced myself that way not to be different. The owner's manual, which I was told a big book is the owner's manual for an alcoholic. This book tells me I have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. My sobriety date, I would like to tell you, was January 4, 1998. But it's January 23, 2017. I have a home group. My home group is the Littleton Somerville Group. I sponsor people. Well, I have five sponsees right now. And uh, I kind of thought about that, and I said, wow, I'm getting myself overloaded. But then again, my sponsor has taught me if my high power didn't intend for me to have them, then I wouldn't have it. So when I'm asked to do something in AA today, I don't say no. Now, what happened? I was born and raised here in Lee County. I'm the youngest of four. And out of the four children, I am literally the black sheep of the family because I have a different father. And I always felt like I had to prove myself. I had to prove that I belong. I fit it in. Uh, we grew up poor. Uh, we didn't grow up poor. We grew up poor. <laughs> and my mother did what she had to do in order to take care of us. 
and she bootlegged. So I grew up in a liquor house. I don't say that that's the reason I became an alcoholic. My teenage years, I didn't particularly drink. I remember the first time I got high was sipping on some Kentucky gentleman and coke. And I didn't know what was happening, and I told my mother I didn't feel too good, and she said, you're drunk. <laughs> that was my first experience of getting drunk or high on alcohol. It wasn't something that I couldn't wait to do again. I didn't dabble in alcohol as a teenager, and I went in the military, and there is where my drinking career started. Now, I think, or I credited my alcoholism to my advancement very quickly in the military. I went up the ladder real quick. 23 months, actually, my basic training was cut short from eight weeks to six weeks because we were going to Vietnam. My AIT was the full eight weeks, and two weeks before we graduated, they called a ceasefire, and they started pulling troops out, so I ended up in Germany. Now, when I got to Germany, I set two goals for myself. One, I wanted to be just like my platoon sergeant. I wanted to be a sergeant first class platoon sergeant. Two, his running partner was somebody I admired because I admired the way he drank. And needless to say, I hooked up with him. And I think I began drinking alcoholically from the beginning because we'd go to the package store at 11 o'clock when it opened. We'd get a fifth of Granddad Hunter Proof. Take the cap off, he take a swallow, I take a swallow, and it's time to get another bottle. And we go through three of those by five o'clock in order to get off to go to the club and start some serious drinking. And I didn't think anything about me having a problem. Because 23 months after I was in the military, I'd made the rank of sergeant. And I used to stay in guard mount, and the first sergeant had a policy. If you stood guard mount and you made what they call the man, if you made it three times in a row, you would be off the duty roster for 30 days. I stood guard mount for other people, and I made it five times in a row. And I would go out guard mount in a blackout and still make demand. My military knowledge was superb. And I looked at it. My alcoholism is what caused me to do all that stuff. I didn't seem to have a problem, but I did notice some of the things that I learned when I came in this program called the warning sign. I was at a meeting last night and they were talking about what are the warning signs to relapse. Well, my warning sign that I might have a problem was getting up in the morning with the shakes, having dry heaves. I figured it was the alcohol, so I switched from old granddad to Bacardi. <laughs> and after three and a half years in Germany, I came back to the States, came back to Colorado. And they told me I couldn't participate in physical training for the first 30 days because I had to get acclimatized to the high climate. And that uh, I might not want to drink as much in the beginning. Well, that high climate had nothing to do with my alcoholism. It didn't hinder me at all because I found somebody there, just like I did in Germany, 
who drink like I drink, and I switched over to vodka. I switched to vodka because they said it didn't smell, but <laughs> vodka do smell. Right after I got to Fort Carson, they needed staff sergeants, and they put my name in to go up for promotion board. And at the time, the minimum requirement was six years time in service. And I only had four years, 11 months. When I got the results back from the board, found out that I had passed, and they gave me one waiver. I figured it would be for my time in service, but they gave me a waiver for education because I only had a high school diploma. Let me go back to that high school. As I said, I was the youngest of four. I was the only one to graduate high school. I was the only one to get a driver's license at 16. And my mother didn't even come to my high school graduation. One of my brothers came. And that was the only family I had at my graduation. But uh, there again, that didn't cause me to be an alcoholic. Well, I get promoted to staff sergeant, and I got less than five years in the military. And that was pretty unheard of for anybody making rank that fast and not going to combat. But I did it. Colorado was a nice place, but it was a place that I could not stay out there long because of the behaviors I had taken up. And my first run in with the law, I had a 69 road runner, four speed, and it was pretty hot and fast. I happened to be riding around town had a couple, well, four guys in the car with me. And I'm showing out, burning rubber at every stoplight through town, heading down the main drag, going back on post, and I happen to notice blue lights behind me. And I figure, <laughs> they're not after me because it's so far back. And uh, I decided to slow down. And just before, my exit to turn in to go on post is where he stopped me at. Had I known that he was after me, I would have just headed on post because they couldn't go on post and get me. But I did the right thing and stopped. He asked me for my driver's license, asked me for everybody's ID card that I had in the car. And then he asked me, do you know why I stopped you? I said, no. He said, how fast you think you were going? I lied. I said, my speed officer said 85. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I clocked you at 105 and 55. <laughs> he said, now, I want you to tell me, everybody, that you have in the car with you. Me being a good sergeant, I'm supposed to know my men, name, rank, and serial number. I raffle that stuff off. He said, well, I'm going to have to take you down to the station and give you a breathalyzer. We get to the station, and the desk sergeant that's going to administer the breathalyzer, he's just a sergeant. I'm a staff sergeant. And I start telling him how to do his job. <laughs> In other words, I'm pulling rank on him. Not realizing that military had no jurisdiction over civilians. <laughs> anyway, he said if this stops at a point seven, you're good. <clears throat> it stopped at a point two seven. <coughs> a point two seven. He said, you're double drunk. <laughs> so I go through procedures, call my friend, 
gonna get me out of jail. We go back, he get my car, I drive his car on post, he drives my car on post, and I go to the barracks. <coughs> and again, I'm showing out. Burning rub in the parking lot. MPs come up. They want to try to arrest me. I get belligerent with them. Why are y'all effing with me? I just got done dealing with civilian police. Now y'all messing with me. I want to go in my barracks and go to bed. They say, well, I'll tell you what. We see your car any more tonight. We locking you up. So I proceeded to go in the barracks. I didn't live in the barracks. I lived in the housing area. I was married. I had four. <laughs> I got just as close to the barracks to see them get out of sight. I get in my car. I go out the back gate to a bar and drink some more. Now, when I came into this program, y'all used big words that I didn't understand. You used words like footwork. You used words like resentment. You used the word that was really strange to me, responsibility. I didn't do any of that. My court date comes up, I go to court. I don't have my citation, so I asked the lady front, do I need my ticket? She said, what are you charged with? I say, uh, driving under influence and speeding. She said, how are you going to plead? I say, guilty. She said, you don't want to do that. <laughs> I said, if you plead guilty, that lady judge is going to take your license today. What you want to do is try to get it amended to driving while ability impaired. So I go in and I get a postponement, got a new court date. Still didn't do any footwork. Didn't get a lawyer. Court date comes up. I go see the prosecutor that morning and I tell him I want to get it amended. I didn't know that state trooper that stopped me his report, he wrote up a hell of a report on me. He said that I said my speed on said 85, even though he clocked me at 105. Even though he clocked me at 105, I was not reckless. I had full control of the car. And I'm thinking, how can you be driving 105? blow a point two seven and not be reckless. Didn't matter. He wrote it up that way. So the prosecutor said, yeah, I'll accept that. I get in front of the judge. The judge said, that will be $50 for the DUAI driving while ability impaired. One dollar for every mile over the speed limit, eight dollars court costs. I walked out of court with an eighty-eight dollar fine. And being a good alcoholic I am, what do I do? I go out that night and I get my second drunk driving. <laughs> In the meantime, when I get this second one, I get two letters. One from the Department of the Army, one from the state of Colorado. The state of Colorado tells me I gotta go to drunk driving school. <coughs> Department of the Army tells me, congratulations, you have been selected to attend drill soccer school, Fort Dix, New Jersey. So I go to this counselor and I ask him, I say, look, what if I get orders to leave here before this class is begin? He said, no problem. You ever come back in the state, you pay a $25 reinstatement fee and you go to court. That was in 1976, and now you've been back to Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was another strange word y'all talked about when I came in here called restitution. <laughs> I had to make restitution on that. 
Well, I get to Fort Dix, and I didn't really like that letter from the Department of the Army because I remember when I was in basic AIT, my drill sergeants don't seem like they ever went home. And I felt like that was going to interfere with my drinking. But I found out it didn't interfere with my drinking at all. I uh, did my tour there, left there and went to the advanced NCO Academy, went back to Germany. When I was at Fort Carson, my unit went to Germany for Reforge in 76. And when they came back, they left half the unit over there. They activated the unit over there. When I got to Germany the second time, I ended up in the same company, same platoon, three of the same guys that I had at Fort Carson. That tour went good. I went from Fort Dix, Fort Benning, three months school, got to Germany in August, October when the Army Times came out, I saw my name, I'm promoted to Sergeant First Class. I've got my dream now, Sergeant First Class. That platoon sergeant that I had when I went to Germany the first time, got transferred back to the States and I used to correspond with him. And when I wrote him and after I made sergeant, he responded back, I see you made sergeant. I guess your liquor bill went up. I didn't look at it at the time, but other people saw I had a problem before I saw I had a problem. Okay, let me get sober here. The, uh, I come back to the States and they send me to an alcoholic paradise. Because I'd been a drill sergeant, I had the instructor identify my assignments from then on with plush assignments. I got sent back to a university up in Vermont, very famous military school, at an ROTC assignment. There was only 15 military there. And that colonel told us, if we didn't have nothing to do, don't do it there. I taught classes two hours a day, two days a week. The rest of the time was drinking. Didn't have any consequences in Vermont. But when I left New Jersey in 1980, I said, I hope I never see that state again. 84, I was back at Fort Dix. And I'm complaining, why do I get assigned to this post? because you have an instructor identified and we need instructors in the NCO Academy. So, but this time New Jersey did not, was not beneficial to me. I told you I got two drunk driving awards in Colorado. In the span of two years I got four in New Jersey. I don't know what are the consequence of 87 days in jail or the consequence of you will not drive in this state for the next 12 years. Whatever that consequence was the most detrimental to me, it got me into the program by Alcoholics Anonymous. And in 1998, I came into this program and I got involved. I, uh, Left New Jersey in the end of 2001. I moved down here. And uh, I think Wallace brought me to my first meeting down here. We were meeting downstairs. And I used to go to a lot of meetings in Sanford. But I only stayed in Sanford for about six months and I moved to Reedsville. And for the next 11 years, I was in Reedsville and I was very active in AA. I worked in Greensboro, ran a group home for people with disabilities, mental and physical. And when I went to interview for that job, probably the one client I should not have seen is who I saw. 
when I say I, I can't do this. But you know, once I started working in that job, I realized that God had put me in that position. Because in 1980, my oldest brother was in a car accident and was paralyzed from the neck down. And when I would go home, I did not do any direct care with him. And I look at the fact of me being in this job where I had to do total care, bathe, dress, and feed people. I looked at it that God allowed me the opportunity to do for others what I couldn't or wouldn't do for my own flesh and blood. And for that, I am eternally grateful. I stayed in that job for over 12 years. <coughs> And the job transferred me to Lexington. Well, when I got to Lexington, I was also DCM of my district there. I gave up the position because I had moved out the district. I got comfortable. And there's another word that uh, I never paid any attention to, complacency. I stopped calling my sponsor. I stopped talking to people in the network. And for a year and a half, I was in relapse. I remember when I was in Reedsville, I came down here to a meeting one Thursday night, and I was out in the smoking, and a lady walked up, and she asked me, I had another guy with me because I wanted him to meet Tom. She said, where are you guys from? I said, he's from Greensboro. I'm from Reedsville. She said, how far is Reedsville? It's about 100 miles. You drive that far for a meeting? I said, ma'am, I used to drive further than that for a drink. But my excuse was I didn't know where any meetings were in Lexington. Well, where I lived was only eight miles from High Point, and I had spoke at several different meetings in High Point. So it wasn't that I didn't know where a meeting was at. I mean, I drive from Reedsville down here to a meeting. I drive from Reedsville to Apex to a meeting. I drive to Lexington to a meeting. It's not that I didn't know where meetings were. I just chose not to go to meetings. Well, after a year and a half in relapse, I picked up. And it was 10 times worse <coughs> for the next two years. I drank chronic. I would get up in the morning, drink all day, go to bed drinking, get up in the middle of the night drinking, and that's all I did. And I was drinking because I could not not drink. I thought that I would take that drink in the morning to calm the shakes, but I realized that I wasn't calming the shakes. I was feeding that phenomenon of craving. And I had a granddaughter who was 15 years old before she ever saw me take a drink. Those two years, she did not want me in her life. This past June, she graduated high school on her way to college, and I was invited to her high school graduation. When I came back, I went to Sanford, and I was very ashamed, and I didn't know how I was gonna be able to walk back in that do the doors up there. There was a guy standing out front smoking, and he said, you back? I said, yeah, I'm going back home. He said, what do you got, about 20 years now? I said, no, nah, I threw away 16. He said the most profound thing I'd ever heard. He said, you didn't throw it away, you just changed your sobriety date. <laughs> that gave me the courage to walk in that meeting and tell the people that I had been back out and I had picked up a drink after 16 years of being sober. This program is the only fellowship that I've ever belonged to 
where we pick each other up. We don't put each other down. I had to concede, like page 30 says, I had to concede to my innermost self that I was an alcoholic. We are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. When I was in Sanford, I got a sponsor. I moved to Reedsville, I got a sponsor. And when I came back to Sanford, I went back to that sponsor and asked him if he would sponsor me again. And he asked me three questions. Do you have an honest desire to stop drinking? Do you believe in a power greater than yourself? And are you willing to go to any lengths? I said, yes, to all three. He said, you just work the first three steps. Now, in the morning when you get up, I want you to ask your high power, I don't care what you call it, to help keep you sober today. And at night, you thank him. And he said, yeah, I will continue to sponsor you. Me and my sponsor, we do a lot of road trips. Somebody gave me a nickname up in that area up there. If anybody want to know where a meeting's at, ask Marshall. <clears throat> he go to meetings everywhere. You know, this is my home. Doesn't make any difference where I'm at. I walk into a room of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm at home. I couldn't find that out there in the bars. The only thing I saw in the bars was drinking acquaintances. I tell a lie, they tell a lie, we see who could tell the biggest lie. In here, I don't have to lie. I don't have to hide behind anything. I can be me. And this fellowship has given me that ability. Life is not, I, when I was going through outpatient, they made me go through outpatient before I went to inpatient. I thought that was kind of backwards, but <laughs> that's where they do it here in North Carolina. I grew up in AA in New Jersey, and when I moved down here, y'all didn't do it right. But I had to realize that I had to embrace the difference. I remember a lady up at Sanford asked me had I joined the group, and I told her no, I was thinking about going down to Primary Purpose and joining. And she said, you know, that's what the problem is here in Sample. We get people with good sobriety and they go somewhere else. That sparked something that an old timer told me in New Jersey. If you're complaining about a meeting, what are you bringing to the meeting? So I didn't come down to primary purpose and join. I still didn't join that group, but I moved to Lexington got a home group, and when I came back, everybody's asked me, you join the group yet? You join the group yet? Nope. And uh, I ended up joining the Lilliton group because it was struggling, and I remembered if you are talking about a group, what are you bringing to it? And my thing today is to try to be of maximum service to myself and my fellows. And my fellows is Alcoholics Anonymous. I, uh, when I got sober in 1998, I was losing a job, a wife, and a house. And my sponsor told me, if it's going to cause you to pick up a drink, you need to share it in a meeting. So I go to the meetings every day whining. Oh, I want my wife back. I want my wife back. And an old time, I got tired of me whining. And he stood up and said, you know, if you're lucky, you might get her back. But if you're really, really, really lucky, you won't. <laughs> 
I didn't get the wife back. I did lose the job. I lost the house, but I stayed sober for 16 years. When I started reading in the book, wife or no wife, job or no job, we can get sober. How God had put people in front of me right when I need them. I was losing that house and I was sharing in a meeting. I gotta find some place to live. And a guy said, my uncle works for a realtor. Won't you make an appointment, go by and see him, see if they got something to rent. So I went to the realtor and they set me up with a realtor of their choice, not my choice. And the lady calls me and she said, we don't rent, we sell. However, I own two pieces of property and one of them's for rent now. You can go by and take a look at it if you want it, then we'll talk. So I went by and looked at it. Now, I'm coming out of a four bedroom house, moving into a two bedroom got to have two bedrooms because doing this divorce thing, I don't know what the judge was thinking. I got custody, my wife got visitation rights to my daughter, and she paid child support. So I needed two bedrooms. I told the lady I, I liked it, but I had to be honest with her. I said, I'm going to tell you. I am a recovering alcoholic. I uh, want to let you know right now, I don't have the money for the deposit or the first month rent. But I have been informed by my mortgage company, if I'm out by the day they specified, they would give me $1,600 to relocate. And I want to know if you would wait until I get that check. She said, I don't know you. I've never seen you before. I've only talked to you on the phone. But it sounds like you're trying to do the right thing. I'll wait till you get that check. It was 14 weeks before I got that check. That lady never called me once and said, where's my first month rent? Where's my deposit? God doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. When I moved to Sanford, the idea was I was going to live with my oldest daughter in a house that I had paid for. I moved here the 29th of November and the 1st of December, I was looking for me a place. A guy in the room, a realtor, tells me, I got this place, we gonna rent it. You can stay in it until we rent it. God doing for me what I can't do for myself. 1994, I got a DWI in North Carolina. I was home visiting. Never did go to court over that. Came home to go to court lawyer tells me there was a new law in North Carolina, first DWI, you get three days in jail. Well, I worked for the Department of Corrections in New Jersey. I only took off enough time to come down to go to court. Lawyer tells me, I just get it postponed. I never got another court date. 2001, I moved down here and I tried to get a hold of him. We playing phone tag. I leave him a message, he leave me a message. The lady that asked me had I joined the group in Sanford, asked me how long had I been around. I said, well, I've been around since 87. I've been in since 98. She said, do you sponsor people? I said, yeah. Do you take them through the steps? I said, don't all sponsors? She said, there's a guy who asked me to sponsor him, but I believe men stick with men, women stick with women. Can I give him your name? I had no idea who she was talking about, but I did do what I was taught in AA. When I go somewhere, 
I tell them I'm new, I'm looking for a home group, and I'm looking for a sponsor. I had did that, but I still hadn't got a sponsor. This guy would come in every day with a tie, and I liked what the guy shared. The man had quality sobriety to me. Come to find out, this was the guy that she gave my name to. I was thinking about asking him to be my sponsor. <laughs> Instead, he asked me to sponsor him, and he only had six months of bride. And I got to telling him about my situation, and he said, did you pay the lawyer? I said, I paid him. He said, how much did he charge you? I said, 500. He said, that's the going rate for a fresh DWI. How much did you pay him? I said, 250. He said, well, if you don't get anything out of him within the next couple of weeks, let me know, and I'll take your case. He's going to have to give you your money back because he didn't represent you. A few more days go by. He said, you know what? I'm not going to charge you. I'll take your case, and I'll get you a court date. Now, my North Carolina driver's license expired in 95. <laughs> we go to court February of 2002, and the first thing the judge asked that my lawyer was, would you tell me why I'm trying a case in 2002 from 1994? And he said, well, he's originally from here. He was out of state at the time. He's uh, Move back. He's trying to clean up records of the past. He's very active in recovery. And uh, she said, okay. She gave me a fine and told me I would have one day in jail. I was on tears. So she said, when do you want to pull that one day? I said, how about next Friday? She said, 12 o'clock Friday, you report to the jail, and you'll be released 12 o'clock Saturday. I left out of that court with a driver's license that day. God doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. He always seemed to put people in my path just when I need them to be in my path. I owe my whole life to, oh, getting back to that wife that I lost. <laughs> she told my daughter I wasn't going to stay sober. Well, when I went back out, 16 years I had been by myself. I'm comfortable. I get drunk, I get married again. <laughs> When I get ready to go in rehab, this wife asks me, you think we're going to make it when you get out? I say, I don't know. When I got out of rehab, I told my sponsor I didn't think me and her was going to make it, but I'm not supposed to make any major decisions in the first year. I waited a year. We separated. And I told her I wasn't leaving the marriage to try to end the marriage. I was leaving the marriage to try to save the marriage. I felt like we would be better off. She got her place, I got my place. After a year and a half being separated, we're back under the same roof now. I don't know. She, she drank when I went to rehab. I go to rehab, she quit drinking. And, but things will work out the way God intended for them to work out. I told somebody that, that we was back under the same roof now, and she said, progress, not perfection. I'd like to close with something that I've carried in my wallet for 20 years lady in my home group in New Jersey come to a meeting one day and she was complaining. Somebody else complaining, not me this time. 
She had gotten a call from a guidance counselor at school that her 12 year old son had to be put in a special class. The upside to that was his son was in the same class. Her husband come home from work that day and he tell her he don't want to be married anymore and they'd only been married six months. A, a wedding, they got married in the clubhouse. <laughs> She's cursing God. She goes to her sponsor, and she's cursing her sponsor. Don't God see what I'm doing? I sponsor women. I've been sober for eight years, this and that all. And our sponsor gave her this. And she read it, and I said, could I get a copy of it? And any time when I start questioning God, I refer back to this. It's called, I ask God. I ask God to take away my pride. God said no. He said it wasn't for him to take away, but for me to give up. I asked God to make my handicapped child whole. God said no. His spirit is whole. His body is only temporary. I asked God to grant me patience. God said no. He said patience is a byproduct of tribulation. It isn't granted. It is earned. I asked God to give me happiness. God said no. He gives blessing. Happiness is up to me. I asked God to spare me pain. God said no. He said suffering draws you apart from worldly cares and draws you closer to me. I asked God to make my spirits grow. God said no. You must grow on your own, but I will prune you to make you fruitful. I asked God for all things that I might enjoy life. God said no. I will give you life that you might enjoy all things. I asked God if he loved me. God said yes. I asked God to help me love others as much as he loved me. And God said, oh, finally, you get the idea. Stop telling God how big your storm is. Instead, tell your storm how big God is. I'm a chronic alcoholic. My name is Marshall. Thank you.